Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started today. It is my pleasure to be here for the day. Um, I never thought I'd ever get the chance to be here watching, um, <laughs> but uh, I'll try and do my best. Um, I am here to introduce Nicole Rajwan. She is a uh, professor at Stanford, and she has a joint appointment in the School of Education and the Woods Institute for the Environment. She got her degree at the Forestry and Environmental Studies uh, School at Yale University, but she has spent time during her degree and before her degree working for a variety of different conservation organizations. I've been lucky enough to go visit Nicole at a number of her different research sites and work sites, including Grand Canyon, mm -hmm. um, Bob Goes Islands, Claim Sisu, which is actually not too far from here. I highly recommend everybody go out there and see it. And she's going to present on that. In addition, she is on a number of different international and national boards, including she's a council member on the National Environmental Education Advisory Council for the EPA. So she gets around. So, but she's got a lot of stuff to cover today, and I'm going to go ahead and let her get started. Great. Thanks, Janelle. Uh, can everybody hear me in the back? Great. Well, I am delighted and absolutely honored to be here today, and not the, the least of which reason is that it's wonderful to be at a school of communications. I've been working in the field of environmental education for about 15 years now, and the fields of environmental education and communications have an awful lot in common, but I've not had the pleasure of speaking to communications professionals before, so I really look forward to learning a lot from all of you and hope to preserve a bit of time at the end of this talk to hear some recommendations and suggestions from you um, as to places where I could take this research and potentially some future strategies for sharing the findings from this research. So I do hope to, to leave about five or at least ten minutes at the end, um, but I do also hope to say that I, I'll be around for um, some time later this afternoon as well to speak with some of you. So thanks for inviting me. I really do appreciate it. I'll start by talking a little bit about some background on what exactly is environmental education. I recognize that I'm not the, the typical kind of speaker that you have for this series, so I'll just give a little bit of background in the field. I'll talk about uh, environmental behavior in the context of the study and scale in place, which are the three elements that swirl together in the research I'll be presenting today. Talk about the rationale for the study, what got me interested in it, and then the research questions that guided the research in the study the design and the methods, and then just do a flyover of some of the findings. This is a large study that took a number of years to complete, and if we were to actually go through and dig into each of the findings, it would probably take us the next, oh, at least three or four hours, and we don't have time for that. So I'll just kind of touch on a few of the highlights that I think might be of the most interest to you. And then I'd really like to spend time on talking about what some of the implications are for education and communications and some of the future research. And then, as I mentioned, get into um, some of the areas where I think perhaps you could help me think more about ways to turn this research into um, potentially some, some future research options. So starting with the background, um, I'd like to bring us all down a notch by talking about some of the things that I think we unfortunately all know are happening. We're, we're facing some pretty pressing and mounting environmental issues in our world today. Um, as we all know, most scientists in the world agree the leading scientists are, are telling us that, that environmental issues are, and in, in climate change in particular, is happening at a rapid pace. And human activity is, is the cause of this. Um, this picture is the Greenland ice sheet, which is continuing to recede. And as we know, these average temperatures um, will rise as much by 12 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the 21st century if greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise at the current pace, which is pretty sobering. This is a graph that shows species loss and extinction. And human activity has increased the background level of extinction, which is the natural rate of extinction, um, by what some scientists believe is as much as 10,000 times the natural rate of extinction. At the same time, the human population on Earth has grown more in the last 50 years than it did in the previous 4 million years. Adding to that the fact that the impacts this human population is having is pretty staggering. This is not meant to be a talk, however, about despair. <laughs> this is meant to be a talk about hope, and that's actually what keeps me getting up in the morning. And that's also what keeps me in the field of social science and environmental education. It's a belief that humans 
can be this, this force for change and this force for pro-environmental behavior, that humans have this need and this desire to be a positive force for change in the world. And in, in the field of environment and conservation, we often talk about um, thinking about a three-legged stool of science and policy and then what we call the social sciences. So we often talk about the social sciences as being education, communications, capacity building. And that's what motivated my study and my research. So I'll be talking about today the work I've been doing in environmental education and how this links with behavior change and what motivated the research that I've been doing over the past 10 years. So I'd like to put up a definition of environmental education. This comes from the Tbilisi Declaration. This is a founding document in the field of environmental education. And the field of environmental ed is actually relatively young, especially when you compare it to many of its sister fields. I would say the closest field we have is probably something like health education and promotion, with which I'm sure many of you are familiar. And I know a lot of you actually work in this field. So the Tbilisi Declaration um, was, came out of a, a UN conference that occurred in Tbilisi, Georgia in 1977. And the piece of this declaration that I think is most relevant to our talk today is the third bullet, which is focusing on this idea of creating new patterns of behavior. So I think a lot of people, when they picture environmental education, they picture kids in the woods, they picture um, you know, the, the very hands-on, the element of it that's, that's certainly very important, it, but it, I think a lot of people, um, you know, kind of, it's, it's the kind of granola, hippie, crunchy, you know, take kids out in the woods, um, spend maybe a week doing residential environmental education, one element that's very important. Another vision of environmental education people have is the K-12, um, a module you might throw in as part of a sixth grade environmental curriculum or science curriculum. When rather, when you think about a more holistic definition of environmental education, it really is thinking about knowledge, values, attitudes, um, and developing these citizen action skills that are about lifelong learning. So it's about this engagement for citizenship and focus on behavior. So knowledge and attitudes and values are only as good as they are um, toward moving, or moving people toward behavior, which is really a critical element of environmental education. So we think about motivations for environmental behavior. As I mentioned, a lot of this draws from what we've learned from fields that are, that are for example, health, health promotion behavior. The challenge we've had in environmental education is a lot of it to this point has been quite atheoretical. A lot of it has been based on these experiences we've had with kids in the woods. A lot of it's been based on one-off opportunities for curriculum. Not a lot of it's been based on what we learn in fields <coughs> such as psychology or sociology or anthropology or even fields like communications, which do have a very strong theoretical base. When you look at things like health promotion and communication, you can say that there, we know a lot about how we move people to action. However, the challenge is that in something like health, it's a very immediate impact. So people are moved toward behavior through health because they can see the immediate impact on themselves and their family. One of the challenges we have with environment is, for example, getting back to some of those depressing slides I put up earlier, but something like climate change, it can be a much longer time frame and a much larger scale. It's much harder often to make an argument to somebody about why they should not drive to work today because it will have an impact over a much longer time frame. So there are then often other types of arguments you try to make to people in the environmental field as to why they should change their behavior. So one of the, one of the arguments that's often made in the field of environment gets back to this idea of place, which gets to the, the topic of this talk, which is this belief that if people love their place, they'll take care of their place. And this is something on which people have really hung their hat in the environmental field. And you'll see it written in, in brochures, you'll see it using communication messages, you'll see entire education programs framed around it. And yet the really amazing and challenging thing is there's been very little research done to try to look at whether this link between place and connection to place and love for place, whatever that, that kind of generic term means, really does have any impact on whether people actually take a behavior to make any difference around their place. So that's part of what motivated the research I'll be talking about today. The other thing that motivated the research I'll be talking about today was, as Janelle mentioned, I previously worked at World Wildlife Fund. And while I was working at WWF, something really interesting happened, and this was in the late 1990s. Um, there was a massive shift that occurred in the conservation movement. In the late 1970s, all throughout the 1980s, and into the early to mid 1990s, there was a very heavy emphasis on something called community-based conservation. And I'm sure a lot of you, again, who work in the health, um, health field, have a, a comparable context for this in thinking about community-based social marketing or community-based marketing or community-based efforts. When you think about the importance of getting communities engaged and making decisions about their own livelihoods, about their own futures. And there was this belief in the conservation movement that, of course, in order to make better decisions about your natural resources, it was important to get communities engaged in that. 
Well, suddenly in about the mid to, mid to late 1990s, we had all of these government and international reports coming out with some, some figures such as the ones I threw out at the beginning of this talk. They were saying that biodiversity was being lost at an incredibly rapid pace, climate change was occurring, continuing to occur, and nothing was happening. None, none of the millions of dollars that conservation organizations were pouring into it seemed to be doing a whole lot of good. And so these large organizations, in, in somewhat of a panic and also somewhat of a change of strategy, decided that they needed to make a, make a drastic move. And the drastic move that was made was this move toward eco-region or large-scale conservation. So in some ways, this can be seen as kind of a, a direct opposite to this community-based conservation. So community-based conservation was done at a very small scale, was really focused on, on empowering local communities. So much of the money there was, was put toward very small-scale local communities. Suddenly, we've got this shift to large-scale organizations based in Washington, D.C., and Guam, Switzerland, and London. Um, these international organizations who are developing these large-scale plans that are then kind of, um, I hate to use the word imposed from above, but in some ways, you know, this is what it was done. These blueprints were created from a much larger scale and then brought down to, larger, brought down to smaller communities. When I use the word eco-region, I should also point out that this is a definition used by some organizations. Other organizations will call it large-scale conservation. Other, regions, other organizations will call it bioregional conservation. Here I'm using the term ecoregion. It's a geographically distinct area of land or water that's characterized by climate, ecological features, and plant and animal communities. I'm using this here just to keep us all on the same page, but you'll see a lot of other terms when you look throughout the literature. There are a lot of benefits to ecoregion conservation, and I can see a lot of head nods when I describe this term because it's certainly something when you look at it ecologically or biologically, it makes an awful lot of sense. It's this idea that by protecting a larger area of land or water, you're protecting all of the species and the habitats that occur within that. So even as you look around the room at some of these gorgeous pictures here, I mean, you can certainly see that by protecting these larger, these larger areas of land, you're, you're creating a much larger corridor for these, for these species that occur within there. The other beauty of this approach is that you're creating a longer term time frame. So 50 to 100 years is much more appropriate, especially for a strategy like education, which takes a long time to work. The challenge is that it's very natural science-based. It doesn't occur um, to, when you're, when you're thinking about an ecological perspective, it doesn't really occur to think about how do you engage people in thinking about ecoregion conservation. So when I was at WWF in the education department, we had a very difficult time thinking about how do you do ecoregional education? So some of the questions we were trying to ask as practitioners were, how do you create an ecoregional approach that's based on environmental education? So when I use EE here, I know there's entertainment education as well, especially for, for folks in this room. But when I use EE, I'm talking about environmental education. So how do you create environmental education concepts that are appropriate for an ecoregional scale? Do you need to tell people they live in an ecoregion? Is that important? Does that actually lead to any kind of behavior change if we're thinking back to that's the outcome that we're trying to reach? And then do we need to focus on ecoregion-wide issues? Do we need to talk about climate change? Do we need to talk about toxic chemicals which occur at that scale? Or is it more compelling to really focus on a smaller scale and then hope or use communications and education strategies to link that smaller scale to a larger one? These are some of the questions that remained unanswered um, at the time that I was at WWF, which was the late 1990s. That led to the research questions that, that were posed in this study, which were, Number one, do some people develop a connection to place on an ecoregional scale? So what I did was I kind of thought about these, these on-the-ground strategies that you would use at a place like WWF or Conservation International or Nature Conservancy, and then I took a, a number of steps back and thought about, okay, can we start thinking about theory? And we, in thinking about theory, we get back to this idea of the individual, and we think, okay, how does the individual picture themselves as living in an ecoregion, which is what led to this first question. Does, it, does an individual picture themselves as living in an ecoregion? And if so, my theory is that some, some people do. Some people have that concept. And if so, why is it? Why do some people think of themselves as, as in their place at that scale, and why do others not? What are the factors that are associated with that for some people and not for others? Um, and then the third question was, if so, are there any links with environmental behavior? Is it a scale that's compelling? Uh, I could kind of see this going both ways. I could see people being completely overwhelmed by the idea of an ecoregion and thinking, I can't make a difference. If I'm one tiny cog in this wheel, perhaps an ecoregion is way too overwhelming. Or you could also see it being the opposite. You could see it as, I'm part of this much larger movement. Perhaps it is, perhaps it is a scale that could be compelling. So these are kind of three questions. Yes? Can I just ask a Absolutely. clarification question? So for your first question, do some people develop a connection to a place? Are you interested in people who inhabit 
that particular place or people who visit it. <coughs> sometimes yeah. people can develop that's a, a very question. close connection Absolutely. just by visiting some yep. of these beautiful places. Absolutely. That's a great question. And then another question I have is that there's a whole different set of concerns about people who are living in the develop developing world yeah. who may need to you know, survive in this community and maybe using resources because you know they're living in subsistence situations yeah. versus the U.S. And so I'm wondering, yeah. do these research questions apply to the developing world or to, to the U.S.? And, and yes. Yeah. That's a great question. Just, I guess, boundary. Yeah, that's yeah, a great question. What are the boundaries question. around your research? Yeah, so the, so the first question is that I was, I was interested in residents and not in visitors, although there is a, there is a huge body of literature on sense of place and place connections. The majority of, or a lot of the research has been done on visitors, which is a, which is a great point. And particularly in, um, and I w unfortunately won't get into this a lot now, but anybody who's interested in talking about it afterwards, I would be delighted to get into this conversation. A lot of the research has been done on place attachment, which is one element of sense of place. Um, place attachment, place identity, place dependence, which is probably pressing it a little bit too much, has been done particularly in the recreation literature. And that is really done with people who are visiting on a short time. And absolutely, you can form a very powerful connection to a place through a very short-term visit. And in fact, you can form a pretty powerful connection to a place um, without even visiting. Yeah. I mean, so for example, you know, there are a lot of people who are connected to the Great Rift Valley and have never been there, nor will ever be there. You know, so there are people who are willing to, um, to give money to conserve a place that they might not, not ever visit. So, that, so that's one element. And, and in this study, I specifically, though, was interested in residents of a place, is one element. And then your second question was about you know, developing country versus developed country. So, so that was, my intention was that I was, interest, I was interested in both of those contexts. Um, for reasons that I'll discuss in a minute, when I chose my case studies, I ended up with two sites in the US and one site outside of the US. Um, I would have been more, I actually had chosen a second site that was also a developing country context, which was on the border with Mexico, and for safety reasons, I went down and did some pre-dissertation scoping there, and for safety reasons, wasn't able to conduct my research there. Um, but I do, I do think it's equally, I think it's equally valid um, in a developing sure, country but context. it's different, there are totally it's, different um, motivations absolutely. and different strategies and everything. Absolutely, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I totally agree. I think that's an excellent question. I absolutely agree. And I, and I think that the findings, and that's why um, initially, and those of you who are dissertation advisors will laugh at this, <laughs> when I initially went into this, my, my initial thought was, I will do 10 sites. It will be fantastic. <laughs> and I ended up doing three sites, and it took me a very long time. Um, but I, I couldn't agree more that the, that the context is incredibly important, which is why I thought it was very important to do three sites. But I think that, I think that doing more sites would be very important as well. <clears throat> so there were a number of theoretical bases on which the study was based. And I, and I, again, I'm really pleased to be at a school of communications. And I know just from looking at the backgrounds of some of you who are here that a lot of you are working in very interdisciplinary um, research. And so you will appreciate that, that this, this drew on, on studies from a number of different fields. Um, so place theories, as I've just, just mentioned here, I mean, this, there are many people from anthropology, sociology, psychology, geography, <laughs> education, communications, um, political science, I, I, I could continue with this list, that are looking at place theories from a variety of different perspectives, natural resources, uh, tourism, um, that are looking at place theories from a number of different perspectives. And the interesting thing to me, and, and slightly surprising, is that not a lot of people actually draw these all together. And when you look at them from a variety of different lenses, of course, in some ways, you kind of see what you want to see in them. Um, which, I, again, the, for those of us working in interdisciplinary work, I think we're sadly not surprised by that. I think you kind of take your own slice at, um, at this work when you, when you approach it that way. Um, but so there were, there were a number of place theories built into this. Also a number of theories on community and community principles looking at um, created communities as well, because certainly an ecoregion is a created community. It's kind of, it's, it's um, a, an organization, it, a number of organizations decide to put a boundary on this community, and especially from the social perspective, it's not necessarily a community before the organization decides it is. So that's a really interesting aspect of this as well. And then communities of practice, which of course then occur once you've created this community. Values of nature was a really interesting one as well. The values typologies, which are created, um, that comes from the philosophy perspective a lot of times, and thinking about how people value nature and the way that impacts behavior. 
And then behavior theory, so there, are, as many of you know as well, there are a number of different ways of kind of slicing the behavior piece of this too. The theory of plant behavior is one that's used most frequently perhaps in the, in the recreation and environment literature, but there are a number of other ways of looking at the behavior aspects of this as well. Again, this is all very exploratory, so the study was designed to kind of pull in aspects of a number of these different theories, and in future research I would like to, to do more exploration in each of these different areas. For the purposes of the study, I did have to choose and kind of go with one of the definitions of sense of place. So the one that guided the instruments in development of this study was to think about sense of place as referring to the, to the affective, cognitive, and values-based relationships, so focusing on the relational element of sense of place that people develop with their places. And then also the multidimensional aspect of it, um, which is that a lot of times, in especially thinking about it as being um, as, as being an interdisciplinary study, so thinking about not just the biophysical, which again is not just kind of the spectacular vistas, but also recognizing the social and the cultural elements of place, um, the, bio, the biophysical, the political, economic, and also the psychological elements of how you feel about yourself and your place connections were all really important in developing the instruments in the study, as well as thinking about the way that the, the results of the study would be put forward. So as mentioned, this is an exploratory study. Also as mentioned, this is case study work um, and mixed methods. It was very difficult to choose the three case studies here. Uh, the way it was done was I tried to get a, a variety of geographical areas, um, tried to get areas that had a variety of different types of size, both geographical size and population numbers. Some that were politically cohesive, therefore had hard borders in them, and others that didn't have as hard of borders. Some that were more culturally cohesive than others. And then all of the sites, though, were high priority for conservation. So all of them were sites that various conservation organizations had selected as being important for, for conservation. That was important because I wanted a place where I could actually kind of base myself and I knew that ecoregion conservation was already occurring. So I'll run through the three sites just briefly just to give you an idea of where they are. The first was the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador. There are actually 30 to 40,000 residents in Galapagos, which a lot of people don't know that. Um, in, the people have actually only been living in Galapagos since about the 1920s, so it's a pretty interesting area. It's um, culturally quite young in the sense that most people who are living there are coming from Ecuador, but there's also a pretty strong German population there as well. Um, the language is, for the most part, Spanish, but then you also have a, a number of German speakers and, and English speakers as well. And it's also very physically bounded. You're either in Galapagos or you're in the water. <laughs> very <laughs> culturally, very, very distinct boundary. It's pretty easy to see where the ecoregion is. The Klamath Siskiyou ecoregion, which as Janelle mentioned, is Northern California and Southern Oregon, about 850,000 people. So this is kind of my in-between region. Um, it actually is a historical sense of this being a region. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the state of Jefferson. I see some head nods here. It's a very interesting place. I'd be happy to talk more about it later if you're, if you're interested. Um, so there's kind of this sense that people have of this being kind of a renegade area, uh, potentially someday wanting to break off from California and Oregon. Hasn't happened yet. Keep your eyes open for that. <laughs> and the Chesapeake Bay, which is my big, unwieldy 16.6 uh, million people, parts of it's six states in the District of Columbia. Um, much, it's the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed. A lot of people just think of it, the Chesapeake Bay as being along the Chesapeake Bay itself, but it actually extends much larger. Um, so this is definitely the, the largest and most uh, diffuse of the three sites. So it was a mixed method study that included interviews in all three of the sites. These were um, semi-structured interviews using snowball sampling. So trying to get a mix of people, some people who had really deep and intense and rooted connections to their places, some people who had worked in, eco worked in professions that took them across the ecoregion, other people who uh, didn't have, who, who others would point to as saying, yeah, that's somebody who really is deeply connected to this place, and others who were kind of just the opposite. So it was really trying to get, again, very exploratory, trying to get a sense of people across that, across that division. And then a number of surveys, these were done, this was using a stratified random sample, not intended to be represented across the entire ecoregion, but really trying to test out some of these ideas. And then ethnographic study, including observation and participation, I lived in each of the three sites for a number of months. The survey instrument was developed based on a number of other studies, and as you mentioned earlier, there have been a, there have been a lot of people looking at sense of place, so I pulled from a number of other studies. There have not been a lot of people looking at sense of place and scale, <coughs> so some of the scale activities were things like using mapping exercises, um, 
this is something that needs to be done in the future is to go back and validate some of these instruments. I used, uh, I used some indices that had been developed by others, which was nice to be able to build on those, but there's certainly a lot of work that needs to be done with, with these instruments in the future. So again, this is very exploratory at this point. So question one, the first question was, do people develop a sense of place in an eco-regional scale? And the cocktail party answer to this question was, no, people don't think about themselves living in eco-region. Are you crazy? So we'll see what the answer was. Um, so the first cut on this was, do people have a sense of place here at all? And not surprisingly, the answer in all three sites, this is on a scale of one to five, do people have a sense of place here? Um, and in all three of the sites, the, the, it went from one being a negative sense of place and five being positive. And people on all three sites did have, did have a positive sense of place connection. This, again, was based on, this is using an instrument that had been used in a number of places in over about the past 30 years. So this is a validated instrument. And people did have a positive place connection in all three places. <coughs> um, not surprisingly, it was more positive in the Galapagos than in the other two sites. The prior assumption, though, was that even if people did have a positive sense of place, it would be more positive at a local scale than it would be at an eco-regional scale. Because people think of a, having a smaller scale connection as being a more positive thing. Um, so then the question is, is that true? And the answer is kind of interesting. Um, so if you'll see here, we've got the yellow bar to the right is the eco-regional scale sense of place. And we actually had in the Galapagos, in the Klamath, um, 30, approximately 35% of people were demonstrating an eco-regional scale sense of place based on, their, based on their responses. And in the Chesapeake Bay, about 15% of the people. The middle bar here is, a pur the purple middle bar here is an interesting group. And this is something I potentially could have predicted, but not something um, that I thought about a lot before developing the instrument. This is definitely an area that deserves more future research. This is what I'm calling the mixed slash medium scale. And the challenge with these people is that in Galapagos, there's not a lot between very local and eco-regional. Because in Galapagos, 98% of the land mass is protected. So that means you either live in a local town or you think about the entire place. You can't actually go outside of your town because it's all protected land. And so therefore, in Galapagos, people either had a choice of saying they felt connected to their town or felt connected to Galapagos. And so therefore, people would say in some of their answers, yes, I feel connected to my town, and other answers, yes, I feel connected to Galapagos. And so people in Galapagos who are ending up in that 43.6% were choosing different answers depending on the question. So they're people that I would consider being kind of a mix. So they're choosing depending on perhaps, you know, in my professional life, I feel connected more at the eco-regional scale. In my personal life, I feel more connected at the local scale. In the other two sites, that's more of a, I would consider it a medium-sized category because certainly, as we all understand, there's a huge continuum between local and eco-regional. And so this is definitely an area that needs a lot more, um, needs a lot more parsing and needs a lot more, you know, <coughs> fine, finer tooth comb. And you'll see that occurring in a lot of the future slides as well. So this is another interesting slide, too. We're trying to look at um, the, the level of this is where we're trying to look at how negative and positive the sense of place is. And again, this is assuming that a lot of people would assume that, that the more local scale sense of place would be more positive. So if you look at Galapagos, it's actually pretty equivalent across all three bars here. The local, the mixed, and the eco-regional is pretty equivalent. But in the Klamath Siskiyou and the Chesapeake Bay, you'll see in the Klamath Siskiyou, the mixed and the eco-regional are actually more positive than the local scale. In the Chesapeake Bay, you end up with the mixed being more positive and the local and the eco-regional. So that is not what the original literature would have predicted, nor would people who you talk to in the environmental education field would predict. So that's kind of an interesting finding. So question two, we get into thinking about, so what are the factors that are associated with people who actually possess this larger scale connection to place? This is a table where I pulled together findings from all three of the sites, and I actually also pulled together findings from the quantitative and the qualitative 
So you'll see anything that's indicated with an asterisk is actually indicating the findings from the qualitative research. But I'm just going to highlight a few of the findings. I, I don't want to go through each one line by line in, in the interest of time. But I wanted to pull out a few that were the most interesting. So if you look across the top, the top line here that shows education as being significant in all three sites. Uh, not surprising, and this is kind of consistent with a lot of social science research that we find, in all three sites, level of formal education was significant, such that the higher, the more formal education someone had, the more likely they were to possess an eco-regional scale sense of place. So in all three sites, with the exception of, of Chesapeake Bay, that was actually approaching significance. More formal education, the more likely they were to have a, have a larger scale connection to place. Another one that was particularly interesting is the second line, which is profession or occupation. Tourism work in particular in Galapagos, but in the other two sites, work at an eco-regional scale was also particularly important in getting people to think about their place at a larger scale. The reason that it's, it's a qualitative finding in the other two sites, that it's particularly tourism in Galapagos, is that in Galapagos there are very few professional sectors. There's only a choice of maybe a handful of different things that people could be doing. And so on the survey, we have a choice of several different professional sectors. And so when we actually we did the analyses on that, that professional sector came up as being statistically significantly correlated with having a larger scale connection to place. In Chesapeake Bay and Klamath Siskiyou, as you can imagine, that would be like here. There would be a million different professional opportunities for people. However, in the interviews and in the ethnographic work, it became pretty clear that people who were working at a larger scale were perhaps not surprisingly more likely to consider themselves and be able to envision their place on this larger scale. So this says to those of us working in education and communications that having a profession that encourages you to really think about these connections occurring on a larger scale is a pretty important element of being able to understand your place and how those interconnections occur. Uh, another one that's really important and I just want to point out as well is this last line which is context dependent. And this is something that I think I would assume that in a conversation I would have with any one of you in this room, that we would all say in our personal life, like, it depends. If you're asking me about my connection with my place and you're asking me the scale at which that occurs, I would say, well, it depends. It depends on if you're asking about my personal or professional life. It depends on when you're asking me. I have an awful lot of people say to me, you know, at one point in my life, it depends on if, you know, right now I, I have a two-year-old. So right now, my scale of place is actually pretty small. You know, I, I don't get out a lot. Well, actually, that's not true. <laughs> Unfortunately for my husband, I do. I travel a lot, <laughs> a lot more than I should probably. Um, but you know, there are times in your life, and I found that stage and life cycle was extraordinarily important with the scale at which people see their place. And so I found that a lot of people in their early 20s who were, who were growing and exploring and were traveling overseas had a much larger scale of place. And then people who were at certain stages in their life cycle with small children reported having a much smaller scale of place. And then at certain stages, you know, people who were retired and were traveling had a larger scale of place. So it was really interesting to see that the context and the way the context really, really seemed to change. So this is something, I, you know, I, I had this quote up here from one of my, from one of my interviews. He said, with small children and a husband out at sea, your support system becomes incredibly important. My sensation was that this house, she was talking to me as we were sitting in her house in Galapagos, was very much my center. So I think that was kind of one really interesting aspect of it. Another, some, another person said, you know, if you ask me a question, living-wise versus my place overall, it includes all of Galapagos, the land and the ocean. So certainly I think this is one element, again, for, for future research It's interesting to look at. So then let's get to the, the so what piece of this. So what does this mean for the kind of work that we do? Why do we care about this? What does this mean for behavior? What are the links between eco-regional scale sense of place and environmental behavior? So again, perhaps another slightly sobering slide. Um, what does this mean for people who take action to address their concerns? One of the questions we asked them were, what are your greatest concerns for your place? Um, and then have you taken any action to address those concerns? And we had just over half the people in Galapagos and Klamath reporting, yes, they had taken some action to address their concerns, and just under half in Chesapeake Bay. And then we asked them, um, we went back and, and ran some analyses to look at what did that mean for what, we looked at whether that linked with the scale of place. And in the Galapagos, of the people who, who had a local scale sense of place, only 23% had taken action, compared to almost 50% of those in the mixed scale group and those in the eco-regional scale group, which is pretty interesting. A similar relationship occurred in the Klamath Siskiyou, so that bo in both those ecoregions, people with mixed and ecoregional scale sense of place were significantly more likely to have taken action than those with a local scale sense of place. 
However, in the Chesapeake Bay, there was no significant difference among those groups. But in the first two groups, it's pretty interesting to note that those of the larger scale pizza place were significantly more likely to have taken action. And the interesting kind of take home message from this is that contrary to some of the assumptions we make, it's not all about the local. It's certainly not saying that the local isn't important, but just the assumption that it's all about the local is, is something we, should, we need to re-examine. We also asked them, if, at what scale have you taken or would you be most likely to take action? And the levels of op the option that they could choose were neighborhood, town, county, region, national, and international. This is actually one of my favorite findings from the study. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, this is one of the things my <coughs> husband said, you spent how many years to find this out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, not surprisingly, people with a local scale sense of place were more, and local and mixed, were more likely to take action at the smaller level. So for example, if you look at in Galapagos, um, those with a local scale sense of place and a mixed scale sense of place were more likely to take action at the neighborhood level. And those with an eco-regional scale sense of place were more likely to take action at the regional level. And then in Klamath Siskiyou, you see a similar relationship occurring, such that those of mixed and eco-regional scale sense of place were more likely to take action at the regional and national level. And in Chesapeake Bay, those with a, an eco-regional scale sense of place were more likely to take action at the eco-regional scale. So moving on, talking about some of the limitations, of course, this is, as I've mentioned, incredibly exploratory at this stage. So I think it's an exciting opportunity <coughs> to do a lot more work in this area and think about what were some of the findings and where can we go from here with, with some of these implications. And again, of course, to refine some of the instruments used and some of the, some of the opportunities, especially around some of the, the mapping instruments that we used in this. But there are a lot of larger scale environmental issues that are facing us right now and, and that require this larger scale perspective. So the question is, how do we make those issues most relevant to people? And how do we link this local scale perspective to that larger scale perspective? And how do we link opportunities for action between those two scales? As I mentioned earlier, this mixed medium group is one that just really bothers me, keeps me up at night. And I think, I wish I'd asked more about that at the time, but in retrospect, you know, it's, a, it's something I didn't have the opportunity to do, so I'd like to do more of in the future. Not surprisingly, this formal education aspect is one that's really interesting and, again, something we find in a lot of social science research. Um, not only was it significantly related to the scale question, but we also ran some analyses looking at direct relationship with behavior. And it was also directly correlated with behavior, such that people with more formal education were also significantly more likely to get involved in taking environmental behavior. So one of the really interesting questions that comes from this then is how do we reach people who have perhaps less formal education and perhaps are more lo locally connected? Um, those are the people who I think there's incredibly important opportunities. And again, when we think about this conservation movement, as we're moving and we're continuing to pour millions of dollars into this really large scale conservation efforts, what happens to all the people who are being left behind? I think that's a really, really important and relevant and essential question to be asking. The dimensionality of place. This is one that really got my attention. I think this is totally fascinating. When I think about in the environmental field, most of what <coughs> we focus on are these beautiful places and the biophysical element, and very little of what we focus on are the pictures on the other side of the room, which is the social and cultural. Um, and I think we forget that the social and cultural can be incredibly moving for people. And that's actually one of the findings I didn't highlight today, but it was very powerful in all three of my sites, was that the social and cultural connection to place was by far the most powerful in all three of my sites. That was by far, through the interviews, came out to the top as one of the most motivating things for all people was having some kind of meaningful opportunity for engaging with friends and family in place. It was one of the most meaningful ways to get people interested and engaged in making, making decisions and making change around their place. And so in a place like Galapagos, where 98% of the land is off, is off limits to people, how do you then make that place still some place that's relevant and still some place where people can have some kind of meaningful interaction and still want to take some kind of action to protect that place? That's a really challenging question. And then what are the results for, for, what are the implications for resulting actions? How do we develop education and communication strategies that help people understand the need to protect and conserve those places while also offering opportunities for engagement? I apologize for the, si the size of the font on this, on this slide. I know that it's tiny. Um, when appropriate, too, I think it's really important to, to leverage communications and education's opportunities to educate around these eco-regional concepts, whether that means needing people to know the term at eco-region, which I'm not convinced that's the most important thing, 
but it's understanding this ecoregion concept and understanding this idea of this kind of local to global continuum and also really emphasizing this human cultural element of it. Highlighting the opportunity for a range of actions at different types of scales, I think that's one of the findings that, that for me was most powerful, that people are going to be convinced for action at, at a variety of scales and just offering one type of action is not going to be appropriate for everyone. Recognizing that communities are not monolithic, that individual voices are incredibly important. And then finally, building in communications theory, I think in education, we really miss that. I think there's so much from communications theory that we can learn, and, and I really hope that I, I will have an opportunity to engage with some of you today as well as in the future. So I, I thank all of you for sitting in this warm room and listening to me go on for 43 minutes. So thank you so much for your time. <laughs> I actually did also want to acknowledge my I had an amazing research assistant team. As you can see, this is a huge study, and I had a lot of help from Janelle in addition to some other amazing research assistants and incredible funders and photographers. So thank you. All right. I was wondering if anybody had any questions. Um, and that's about the role of uh, heterogeneity and homogeneity. So obviously, in Galapagos, you have probably uh, a pretty, it sounds like a pretty heterogeneous population in yeah. some ways, yeah. a lot of people from a lot of places, um, but a more homogeneous kind of um, social and physical environment, perhaps. Perhaps, uh, this mm -hmm. is just thought. But uh, then you go to somewhere like, you know, the Chesapeake Bay region. Being an East Coaster, first of all, it never would have occurred to me that all of that was one environmental space. Um, and if you are from, <coughs> kind of like up to central New York, that feels very different than being from Washington, D.C. Yeah. Uh, you have a much greater diversity of uh, people, income levels, um, all kinds of demographic differences, of course, and then, of course, the, the kind of infrastructural differences mm -hmm. in terms of how the people's built environment looks. Um, what, I mean, obviously, the, the study deals with that in some way, but can you say a little bit about how um, how that, how that worked? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a, it's a really good point. In Chesapeake Bay is an incredibly challenging, uh, in, incredibly challenging ecoregion for that reason exactly. And I think, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting points that you just made is that I don't think it's all about geographic scale in and of itself. Because, for example, you could have a more homogeneous um, ecoregion that could occur at a very large scale. But for a place like Chesapeake Bay, there are, there are a lot of political boundaries that occur there. There are millions of NGOs and nonprofit groups that are working there. And I think one of the things that they've tried to do in that ecoregion is they've tried to work with government organizations and non-governmental organizations who each kind of take a chunk of it and then work together in a consortium, which is one approach. The challenge is I, I don't think that they've done a very good job then of bringing those chunks back together and creating um, creating a hole again. And I think that that's, that's exactly the place where they're teetering right now, is on, is on that brink, because one of the biggest challenges for, with a place, for example, like Chesapeake Bay, is the biggest impact there is not the people who live along the bay. The biggest impact are, for example, the agricultural impacts that are coming from, from Pennsylvania, and, and, so they're, and they have absolutely no bay frontage. And so that gets exactly to this, this challenge with ecoregion conservation, is how do, you, how do you create this kind of ecoregional identity? And this, and this gets to communications, I think, even more than education. What, what are the communications kind of strategies and, and theories that help us think about creating this identity that allows people to understand how, how farmers in Pennsylvania have an impact on the Bay? I mean, there's certainly an educational element to it, but I think a lot of that is, is, is much more coming from, I think communication theory has a lot to say about this, a lot more than education theory does. So I think, I think it's a really good point, and I don't think we have a good answer for it yet. Uh, I wanted to kind of agree, we were trying to ask Kurt, um, the, I think people, because I'm from Pennsylvania, they associated more with the mountain thing, with, what was it, the Adirondacks or whatever. Yeah. They, they associated more with that than the ocean because yeah. they're so far away from the ocean. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you something. <clears throat> Environmental education today, where are they teaching? I mean, it's biology class, it's not, in, uh, is it a civics thing? Is yeah. it a social studies thing? And if you teach it in school, there are whole groups of people who rail against 
radical environmentalists. So when your kid comes home and says, Mom, we got to do this, or they're going to say, you're indoctrinating my kids in school. What do you do? Exactly. Yeah, no, great point. I, so I would say, I, I love what you just said. I would say it's all of the above. And I thank you for not just saying it's biology. Um, I agree. It's all of the above. I think in, environmental education is, there's a science element to it. But I absolutely agree that it's social science and it's civics. Um, and, and there is certainly an element as well of people feeling like it's about activism. And that has been a big, um, a big push in the environmental education field has been to develop guidelines. There's, there's a series of guidelines and excellence for environmental education. And the idea is meant to be that it's around developing critical thinking skills and it's around developing citizenship skills. And it's, so it's meant to be less on the activism side and more on this kind of re-engaging with, um, re with science and citizen science and this sort of thing as opposed to um, making, making one, making one, taking one action based on what someone has told you to do. So that's kind of the way that the field of environmental education deals with that issue. But it's certainly something that the field was slammed on in the late 90s or so there, and there's still a lot of controversy around it, absolutely. I was wondering what kinds of behaviors are uh, people doing in, based on their uh, representation of place. So for example, the people who have a local image versus a mix versus an eco-region, what kind of behaviors, what kind of actions are they taking? Mm -hmm. And if you're at a local level, are you still taking actions that will be beneficial for the eco-region? And so my larger question is, is there some benefit for thinking about your place as an eco-region versus as a more locally? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, we, did, we did look at that, and the kinds of actions that people tended to be taking, we, we also looked at not only the kinds of actions people were taking, but the issues with which people were most concerned. And so the kinds of actions that people were taking at a local level versus at a larger scale, so just one example of that would be things like you know, getting engaged in like a community garden or getting engaged in a community cleanup. Or recycling. Would, or recycling would be yeah. more of a local scale issue versus getting engaged in a, a political campaign or writing a letter to, um, you know, to a congressperson would be, you know, would be like a larger scale type of behavior. And that actually, that actually um, in the broader study, is something that, that would be, that's talked about as a future area of research that would be really interesting. Would be trying to kind of parse out even further those types of behaviors. Um, another really interesting one, though, was trying to look at what, are, what were the concerns of people. And one, for example, that was really surprising to me, um, in Galapagos, there was people who had a larger scale concern, so people who had an eco-regional scale um, sense of place were more concerned about things like invasive species, which I was surprised by that. I thought that people with a local scale sense of place would be more concerned about invasive species, because that's a pretty immediate thing. I mean, in Galapagos, at least, you, you see invasive plant and animal species. It's, it's pretty clear. But I think that when you have a larger scale connection, I guess you, you probably travel more around the ecoregion and you probably have a better sense of how it's impacting things on a larger scale. Um, but but I, I do think it's really interesting to think about what are the kinds of actions you take. And, I, and I, it's something that, um, again, it was something that kind of spurred my interest in this study, was when I was working at WWF, there is a lot of this rhetoric around local scale connection being better, or whatever that means, it's a very normative word, being better and being more motivating. And yet here I was working with all these people who really had dedicated their entire lives to conservation. You know, and they felt incredibly passionate about it. Um, and yet we're taking very different kinds of behaviors and participating perhaps in a local stream cleanup. So I think it's a, it's a really interesting question, an interesting area for future work. Because it sounds like those local behaviors can be very beneficial to oh, the region. I mean, absolutely. It's, it's actually doing things, changing, modifying absolutely. their consumption. To, absolutely. So anyway. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. it seems to me one of the troublesome things in looking at the differences across the cases focuses on people's feelings of not just identity with the place, but also feelings of political empowerment, how much knowledge people have about where the appropriate places to exercise their political will or to yeah. use their voice would be. And I'm wondering at how you how you sought to look across those contexts yeah. from places that were very developed, with very developed media systems to places that yeah. really uh, were not in the mainstream of political activity. Yeah, no, and, and that's, that's a really good point. And that gets back to the earlier point, too. You know, all three places that I looked at were places where people are quite engaged politically. 
And I think it would be really interesting to, to do a similar study looking at a place where perhaps that's not the norm. Um, now, now, I say that about, there are groups in, in all three places where people are engaged. So for example, in Galapagos, it is very common for people to, 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 um, to go to protests. And in fact, that was one of the most common behaviors that people reported participating in. And same in Klamath Siskiyou. Oh, and you know, certainly in Chesapeake Bay, that includes Washington, D.C., and people go to protests. there's a huge difference in Chesapeake Bay. It's, it's about, true. You know, between somebody in central New York. Yes. Notions of political environment right. versus somebody who lives in a DC suburb. Right, exactly. Or somebody like a congressman in a cocktail. Right. Or somebody like on a small somebody in a small town in Maryland versus somebody in DC. No, that's an excellent it's an excellent point. And I think I think doing a study or even taking some of these results and segmenting them even further by areas within each of the eco regions would be really interesting. And I think it gets to the kind of this idea of locus of control and how much people feel like they really have an impact. On, on what happens around them and on their, on their environment is a huge, a huge and important question, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess just to uh, build on that question, I, a lot of these, uh, the places that you looked at that have very uh, specific um, uh, established zones that are protected, mm -hmm. um, it'd be interesting, I think, to look at a place that doesn't necessarily have this uh, connection to a place that's protect that's a wildlife protected area. Yeah. You know, I don't know, Houston or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Some, some area like that to Los see. Angeles. Los yeah. Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> Los Angeles. Yeah. Like that. So it would be interesting I, I would think to kinda of look at that. Um, so I don't know if you want to comment on that. Also the other thing um, that I was interested in is that did you um, did you ask about things that weren't necessarily connected to sort of environmental or eco uh, issues such as trap that that people don't necessarily associate but are associated with them, like traffic yeah. or something like that. Because in Los Angeles, the numbers you look at traffic and it's the second largest concern in the city, um, and yet it's not really associated with the ecology of the region. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. You know, initially my concern was environmental <coughs> behavior, and then after. I can't even remember exactly when it was. It, it might have just been a few weeks into my first site. I decided that I actually, especially my interviews, I decided I was actually interested in whether people got engaged in any kind of behavior because I, because exactly what you're saying, so much of what people are concerned about is, I mean, so much of it is in, involved in the environment anyway, in some way, even if people don't recognize it. And your point about traffic in particular is a, is a really interesting one. So for example, in Klamath Siskiyou, I had, so I had two questions about um, concerns. One was that I gave them a list of Likert scale questions and six concerns. These are things in your region about which people have said they're most concerned. And then there was a free response. And on free response questions, the number two biggest concern, there's a mega church in this one very rural valley. And the number two biggest concern was traffic from the mega church. And that was across, you know, I think I had 150 respondents from the valley. And that was the number two concern. That's something I, you know, as an outsider, would never in a million years have guessed. And so and it was traffic and safety related to mega church. Um, so I, I think that's a, and, and I think that's a really, um, it was a heartening response to me too, though, to recognize that I think people, you know, people realize a lot more than we give them credit for a lot of times because for them they recognize there was pollution that was related to that traffic, there was safety for their children, yeah. there was, you know, there were biodiversity and species mm -hmm. concerns related to that. So that's well, a great. I, point. I think I think yeah, I mean I think it's really relevant. Like here in Los Angeles, the only way they were able to retrofit a lot of the trunks that come out of Long Beach was not to connect it to an air you know, an issue of ecology, it was to connect it to asthma rates along the freeway for children. And once that connection is <coughs> made, I mean, you know, can't, can't say no to children with asthma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that is, and that is an environmental issue. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's, it, it clearly has ecology issues. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Just, <coughs> I'm wondering what age ranges you were discussing. Because I think that the involvement of someone uh, in beginning in childhood versus the involvement of someone sort of later on in life would have a different, have, would have an impact. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I did just adults, so I did 18 and over for a number of reasons, not those who, least of which was IRB. <laughs> no, and most, you know, most, um, most of my work in this area has, has been with adults, but certainly it is really interesting, and, and I have a lot of colleagues, and I've done a little bit of work with sense of place in children, 
But you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, there's a critical developmental stage that occurs with children looking at connection to place and connection to nature. And that's a, it's a really interesting study. And, and thinking, too, about environmental behavior in children, that's another really interesting question, too. I mean, thinking about at what level is environmental behavior appropriate? And what kinds of behaviors should children be taking at different developmental stages are all really interesting questions. And then getting back to your question earlier, too, of, you know, when you're talking about formal education, what kinds of behaviors are appropriate to be discussing in a formal education context? But it, yeah, it's a great question. This was just with adults, though. Okay, I uh, want to thank Nicole for coming down. Um, I have loved her research, and I am not a science person, as she knows. <laughs> so, um, so I love the fact that she can talk science and she can talk environment in um, English. So um, I want to thank Nicole for coming down today. So. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate you all being here on the